good afternoon and hope we all having um, a lovely day and adhering to COVID-19 guidelines as uh, um, encouraged by the Republican president. Please remember to mask up and avoid crowded um, places. So welcome to today's lecture, uh, Mrs. Vande to present it. Uh, we're looking at the basics of our computers. Okay, so we are unable to meet physically uh, because of the challenges that we are currently having as, as, uh, as a nation and uh, the world at large. Okay, COVID has not spared anybody. Okay, and then also um, have been unable to have uh, the Zoom uh, meetings because of the fact that, you know, we've got different students coming from different uh, backgrounds. Some people are unable to have uh, bundles available. Okay, so they might actually need classes. So in order to avoid that, we've actually instead uh, improvised um, making of uh, these particular videos to help our brothers and uh, sisters. So let's get straight into uh, this particular topic. Okay, so we, we are going to look at the overview. Okay, the history and evolution of computers, the concepts of um, the input process output, characteristics of computers, the classification based on um, the type as well as size, and then application of our computers in different domain areas today. Okay, so before we go straight into looking at the history of computers and uh, as well as its evolution, it's also important that we understand the definition of what a computer is. So we are saying that a computer is actually derived from the word um, compute, meaning to calculate. Okay, so to define it, we're saying it's simply an electronic device or rather machine that accepts data from the users, processes the data by performing calculations and operations on it, as well as uh, generate the desired output results. Okay, so pardon the noise from the background, you know, recording videos is actually tough. Uh, <laughs> and they're taken because of the environment, uh, the, the different environmental factors. So nonetheless, we, we continue. Okay. So, um, as I said earlier, there are two forms of computers. Okay, so we have the digital computers and the analog computers. I remember we actually looked these um, looked at these in class. Okay, with uh, group T, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so um, when you look at digital computers, we really looking at how values um, are represented. Okay, internally. Okay, so all information is represented using digits, zeros and ones. And um, in computer circles, we actually refer to these as binary numbers. Okay, so get to understand these in more detail when we come to look at a topic called data representation. So these will actually make sense. So this is what the computer actually understands. Okay, so we have um, analog computer, just one other kind of uh, computer that represents data as, um, variables across a continuous range of um, values. Okay. Okay, so now we'll look at uh, some of the characteristics that computers actually have. Okay, so the computer has some speed, accuracy, some diligence, okay, it has some storage capacity cap and capability, and uh, as well as um, versatility. Okay, so a computer's speed. Okay, so meaning a computer can process data very fast at the rate of millions of instructions per second. Okay, so a computer needs to possess some speed. Okay, and then a computer is also accurate, provides a high degree of accuracy. So we can't actually compare ourselves as human beings to computers. Okay, the level of accuracy will definitely differ. Uh, differ. And then also in terms of diligence, a computer can actually work for so many hours without getting fatigued or tired, okay? Human beings, because we use blood, okay? We can't actually overwork our brain, okay? Let's we start um, mixing up uh, information, okay? So a diligence is actually one of the characteristics that a computer has, it can work without being fatigued, okay? Oftentimes, like for me, I think it's been one week now. I have not yet switched off my computer. I just put it to sleep, okay? So, but it's still able to work perfectly fine, okay? So, yeah, that is that. And then the storage um, capability, 
So computers have actually large volumes of data and this information can actually be accessed, okay, and retrieved uh, whenever required. Okay, so unlike us as human beings, really our brain capacity is limited. We can't store so much information, okay? Otherwise we'll end up, you know, forgetting even other, uh, other things, okay? So computers have got large storage capabilities and we can always retrieve information that we want at a given time. And then it's also versatile in nature, so it can perform different tasks at the same ease, okay? The way I'll perform different tasks at different times will actually differ. Okay, I may put in more effort in this particular task than the other one because of the nature of me being a human being. Okay, but a computer will actually work without any problem. Okay, it will definitely work at the same ease. Okay. So these are some of the wonderful characteristics that our computers actually possess. And so those are the characteristics of um, computers. Okay, so we'll get straight into the history. Okay, so there have been uh, key developments, okay, that have actually been taking place from as far back as the 600s. Okay, so um, we had uh, the first invention called uh, the calculating machine, uh, Bacas. Okay, so it was the first mechanical calculating device for counting of uh, large numbers. Okay, and then uh, there came the Napier uh, bonds. Okay, a, a mechanical device built for the purpose of multiplication in 1617. Um, okay, so we see some invention there from calculating large numbers to an addition of multiplication. Then there came uh, the slide drew, okay, which was developed uh, by an English mathematician, Edmond Gata Ganta in the 16th century. So using the slide drew, we see another invention where we where they were now able to do operations such as addition, subtraction, multiplication, as well as division. Okay, so uh, from there, we also saw Pascal's addition and subtraction machine um, that was developed, okay, by um, an inventor called Blaise Pascal. And then we also saw Leibniz's multiplication and dividing machine, the punched card system that was developed by Jacquard. And then we had Babaji's analytical engine, an engine, um, an English man. I don't know if I have actually pronounced that word correctly. You have Babaji, um, Charles Babaji, who built a mechanical machine to do complex mathematical calculations in 1823. And then we had um, Hollerith punched card tabulating machine. And this was, de uh, was developed by Heyman Hollerith. Okay, so now to appreciate uh, the history further, uh, these uh, computers have actually been categorized into what is known as generations of um, computers. So we see where these things are actually coming from. Okay, so now there's been a classification of these computers into generations so that we see what happened from this particular generation to this particular generation um, and, and how long it, it lasted. So in the previous slide, we're trying to actually take us back time in memorial to see where these things actually started from. So the classifications will actually begin from uh, the 1940s, uh, um, okay? So up to today. So now um, the classifications of these generations are based on the technology, the computing characteristics such as speed, the number of instructions executed per second, the physical appearance, as well as uh, the um, applications. So this is what we'll actually be able to look at in these uh, generations of computers. Okay, so the first generation um, lasted from 1940 to 1956. So using, uh, so this particular generation utilized the vacuum tubes. Okay, and um, as the hardware, okay, technology. So uh, the first generation of these computers use vacuum tubes for circuitry and magnetic drums for memory. So the input to the computer was uh, through punched cards and paper tips. So the output was displayed as uh, printouts. So now we see that we have um, actually the monitors and other output devices. So now in the first generation, they only utilize the printouts, okay? So like now, if I were to conduct a lecture then in the 1940s, okay? I was actually going to do a printout. 
Okay, so there has been uh, inventions, okay, from as far back as this uh, generation to where we are. So in terms of the software, the instructions were written in machine language and could solve one problem at a time. So this one was not actually done in parallel, but one after another, okay. And then uh, in terms of computational time, it was actually milliseconds, okay. That was uh, how the processing was actually happening. And then in terms of the physical appearance, these computers were enormous in size and required a large room for installation, I can imagine, okay. Having such kind of a hassle, okay one huge computer in a room, okay? So no portability at all. So if you look at today, all this has actually been phased out, okay? We now have uh, portable computers, okay? That we are able to carry without any difficulty anyway, okay? So, and then in terms of application, they were used for scientific applications as they were the fastest computing device of their time, okay? So this is uh, the first generation of our computers. And some of the examples are Univac. We had uh, ENIAC as well as um, EDVAC, okay? And they used a large number of vacuum tubes and thus generated a lot of heat, I can only imagine as well. So um, they also consumed a great deal of electricity and were expensive to operate, okay? So the machines were prone to frequent malfunctioning and required constant maintenance. Of course, they'll definitely malfun uh, malfunction and require constant maintenance, okay? Because of the heat that was actually being produced often, okay? So, and then it was also difficult to actually program, okay? But thanks to the mother of uh, invention okay so we keep on seeing more and more better uh, gadgets today and then the second generation was from 1956 to 1960 so the second generation actually came in to resolve the challenges that were discovered in the first generation where they utilized vacuum tubes so now because of the heat that we that we that, that was being generated by those vacuum tubes so in order to curb that, okay, and reduce on that, there was an introduction of uh, hardware technological transistors. So they replaced vacuum tubes of the first generation computers. So these used magnetic core technology or primary memory. And then they also used magnetic tips and disks for uh, storage purposes. Okay. And then uh, the instructions were written using assembly language. Okay. And then uh, in terms of uh, the computational time, this utilized uh, was, was, was actually done in microseconds, okay? And so these, unlike vacuum tubes, were actually smaller in size. So we realized that with, 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 with vacuum tubes, okay, because of um, their nature, these computers were actually big, okay? And would actually accommodate a room. So now with the introduction of transistors, we saw a reduction in size. Okay, so the size of the computers were drastically reduced. And examples of these are the PDP-8, we had uh, the IBM-1401, then we also had the CDC-1604. So in order for us to actually understand this better, if you've seen in my lecture slides, I think I haven't added any uh, form of uh, pictures. So you could actually Google these uh, examples here and just try to, to see how they, looked in terms of uh, appearance. I avoided images just to avoid having a lot of slides um, in my uh, lecture. Okay, so you could actually Google this. You find them on the internet, they're plenty so that you, you appreciate where we are coming from. Okay, so the third generation was from 1964. Okay, the times and your independence to 1971. Okay, so here we see again, um, an enhancement from uh, transistors, okay, to integrated circuits, okay? So the third generation of computers utilized integrated circuit chips. So the keyboard and monitor were also used to interact with the third generation of computers. So we see how we are actually revolving. And then there was also an introduction of operating systems here, okay? So they also utilized the high level languages that were extensively used to write programs. Okay, and then also instead of uh, machine language and assembly language. Okay, so machine language was coming from the first generation assembly language from the second generation. And then here we see an introduction of high level languages. Okay, um, and then in terms of the computational time, so here it was nanoseconds. Okay, and then in terms of the physical appearance of these computers, we're quite small compared to the second and first generation. So we see, 
okay, that over time size has also been reducing, okay? And then our examples are IBM 370, PDP 11. So you could also take some time, just try to check them out on the internet and other resources. And then the fourth generation, okay? So fourth and fifth generation are actually where we are, okay? This is our present um, generation, fourth and fifth is where we are, okay? so. In the fourth generation, we have now microprocessors, okay? So the hardware here is actually large-scale integrated and very large-scale integrated technology, okay? So we have thousands of transistors being integrated on small silicon chips using the large circuit, uh, sorry, large-scale integrated technology, okay? So this area is marked by the development of uh, microprocessors, okay? So this is where we are today. And then they also utilize semiconductor memory that replaced the earlier magnetic core memory resulting in random access to memory. Okay, so the devices such as magnetic disks became smaller in uh, physical size and larger as well in capacity. Okay, so the linking of computers is another key development of um, this particular era. Okay, and then in terms of software, we had uh, the famous MS-DOS, Okay, which is basically the command line. Okay, so command line is where you simply interact with the computer using commands. Okay, so the, the famous black terminal. Okay, and then uh, also MS uh, Windows. Okay, so you could actually, in fact, even today, okay, these computers actually have the capability of both the graphical user interface, okay, as well as the DOS. Okay, so, but because we are, Invention is actually about making user experience good. Okay, so MS Windows actually comes in handy, okay, because it supports the graphical user interface, okay, which allows users to interact with the computers via different uh, components, such as the menus as well as icons. So, in short, we are able to see what we want, okay. So, unlike MS DOS, you, you can only operate a computer if you understand the commands. Okay, so this feature is, what is also available in our Linux operating systems. You can use the terminal or the Windows side. So in order for you to achieve the terminal aspect, you need to know some, uh, uh, you need to know how to do that. Okay, you need to know how to write commands. Okay, in Linux, the commands that you need to understand, Linux commands, Windows commands, and so on, okay? So now we have high level programming languages that are used for writing programs of, uh, of, of uh, writing programs, Java and so on, okay? And then uh, apart from that, in terms of the computational time for the fourth generation, it's now at picoseconds, okay? So in terms of the physical appearance, they are smaller than the computers of the previous generations, okay? We all know that, okay? So portability has been enhanced. And then in terms of application, they are widely available for commercial purposes and other personal purposes. Okay. And then uh, examples are of course the Intel 404 chip that was first, that was the first microprocessor. The components of the computers like the central processing unit and memory were located on a single chip. And then in 1981, IBM introduced the first computer for home use that was called the Macintosh. Okay. Yeah, so we're coming from the Macintosh era. Though some of us were not yet born then, okay, but those that were there would actually attest to this fact, okay? And then the fifth and present also generation. So fourth and fifth are present, okay? So the fifth is present and next, okay, where we are utilizing artificial intelligence, okay? So if you Google today, you will find that there's so much uh, that is going on in the artificial intelligence world, okay? So this is where we are and this is the future, okay? So the goal of the fifth generation computing is to develop computers that are capable of learning and self-organization. Today, we are also hearing of machine learning, a component of artificial intelligence, okay? So this is the future, okay? So the fifth generation computers use super large scale integrated chips that are able to store millions of components on a single chip. Okay, so these computers have large memory requirements. Okay, and then also they use parallel processing that 
allow several instructions to be executed in parallel instead of uh, the stereo execution. Okay, so because of um, their uh, nature, artificial. Okay, so mainly they um, try to simulate the human way of thinking as well as reasoning. Okay, so at the end of the day, the goal is to mimic how a human brain actually, a human brain actually works and at the same time, how it reasons. Okay, and then now simulate that into uh, a machine. Okay, so this is basically where we are and where we are going. Okay, so there are different aspects of um, artificial intelligence. We have expert systems. Okay, so we have systems. Uh, expert systems are basically systems that uh, mimic uh, a real life expert, such as a doctor. Okay, you could have um, a system specifically working like a doctor. Okay, or an account system. Okay, so it's about specifics. Okay, and then we have uh, natural language processing. We have speech recognition, we have voice recognition, robotics, and many others. Okay, so we actually have a robotics course right here at our institution. Those that are in uh, computer engineering actually do this. Okay, and I'm sure they are appreciating uh, more of uh, artificial intelligence in this particular regard. Okay, so this is where we are and where we are going. Okay, so now away from that, um, these computers are actually classified further into four categories based on their size and type. Okay, so when we talk about computers, it's not just a laptop or a phone, no. There are several uh, classifications and they all fall under a computer, but then depending on the size and type, you will actually be able to know where they belong. So firstly, we have the micro, excuse me, computers. We have the mini computers. We have the mainframe computers. And then we also have the super computers. So the classification here is according to the smallest up to the largest. So micro is the smallest, mini second smallest, mainframe third smallest, and then we have supercomputers that are larger and faster than the rest of these computers. So if you have a laptop, if you have a tablet, if you have uh, a phone, okay, or any other handheld device, so that so those are actually falling in the category of micro computers. Okay, because of their small, um, because of their size, nature. Okay, so the microcomputers are small, they are low cost, and then they are single user as well as digital computer. Okay, so they consist of a CPU, input unit, output unit, storage, as well as software. Okay, so single user because only one person can actually use it. So like now, I'm the only one using my laptop, so it is single user. All that I need is actually residing on my machine. No other person can actually use it. Okay. Yes. So this is a single user. So microcomputers are single user, and then they're also locals. Okay. So and then at the same time they're also portable. Okay. Uh, because we can actually carry them in our bags. We can actually carry them in our pockets and so on. Okay. And then um, we have also desktop computers that are falling under this category. Yeah, notebooks, laptops, tablets, and um, among others. Okay, so these here are falling under the, the category of microcomputers. And then we have the mini computers. These are second smallest. Okay, so they are um, mini computers that are basically also digital computers and generally use multi user systems. So unlike the microcomputers that have a single use, with these ones, you can actually have um, a minimum of four to a max of 200 users simultaneously, okay? And they also have a high processing speed and a high storage capacity than the microcomputers, okay? So um, the users can actually access the mini computers through their PCs or the terminals. Okay, so they are mainly used uh, for real time applications in industries, research centers, and so on. Okay, and an example is uh, the PDP 11 and the IBM 8000 series. Okay, so these are some of the widely used uh, mini computers. And then we have the mainframe that are also multi user, multi programming, and high performance computers. So they operate at a very high speed and have a uh, very large storage capacity and can handle the workload of many users, okay? And then they're also centralized in nature. So if you think of a mainframe, 
um, use mainly in our banks, okay, or places where you want users to access the same information at the same time simultaneously. Okay, so the users access the mainframe computer via a terminal that is often called a dumb terminal and also an intelligent terminal or a PC. So a dumb terminal cannot store data or do processing on its own. It has the input and output device only. Okay. So all you do is uh, connect these dumb terminals to the main mainframe. Okay. So the main mainframe acts like a server. Okay, and everyone else connected there can actually access it. But then whatever they do on their damn terminals, okay, cannot be stored there, but then it's being uh, stored in the mainframe. That is the concept there, okay? And then we have uh, an intelligent terminal that has the input and output device as well and can do processing, but cannot store data of its own, okay? So the dam and the intelligent terminals use the processing power and the storage facility of the mainframe computer. Okay, so like I said earlier, they used in organizations mostly like banks, okay, and other companies where people require frequent access to the same data. Okay, so some of the examples are CDC 16, uh, 6600 and IBM ES um, 1000 series. So you could also look them up on uh, the internet and see just how they, they look, okay? And then we have famous supercomputers. Okay, so these are the fastest and the most expensive machines. Okay. And also they have high processing speed compared to other computers. The speed of the supercomputer is generally measured in flops, working point operations per second. Okay, so some of uh, the fastest supercomputers can actually perform trillions of calculations per second. And then supercomputers are built by interconnecting thousands of processes that can work in parallel. So uh, the reason why they are fast is just basically the fact that they have thousands, thousands of processes interconnected, okay? And they work in parallel. And that is why they are able to achieve um, the characteristic of uh, speed, okay? And we are referring to it as being the fastest, okay? And then they are used uh, in uh, highly intensive tasks, such as calculations, okay, such as the weather forecasting. I don't know if we use this in some, okay. And then climate research, global warming, molecular research, biological research. We now have uh, COVID-19, okay. There's a lot of research going on in our developed countries, even in our country here, okay, but then, I'm sure our developed countries in the Harvards there, they actually utilize this, okay? So they're able to discover a new vaccine, okay, it's through research, okay? And obviously, most likely, okay, they were using supercomputers, okay? Nuclear research, aircraft design, okay? For as long as there's some form of high graphic uh, resolution that is required, Okay, so then definitely you require a machine that is fast in terms of processing. Okay, and then also major universities use this as well. Okay, universities that actually do a lot of research utilize this. Military agencies, okay, scientific research laboratories do this. Okay, they actually utilize that. And then uh, some of the examples are IBM Roadrunner, you have IBM Bluegen. And then we also have Intel ASCI Red. Okay, so these are some of the examples. Again, I'll emphasize you can look them up on the internet and just get to see how they how they look. Okay, and then also uh, away from the classifications. Okay, so all those types of computers that we've looked at from the micro, from the mini, from the mainframe to the supercomputers, they all consist of four parts. Okay, regardless of whether it's a supercomputer, whether it's a mainframe, they have these four main parts, and that is the hardware, that's the software, the data, and the users. Okay, so we've already defined what hardware is. Okay, so hardware in simple terms, rather, it's just something that you can see and touch, okay, or the physical components of the computer. Okay, those are hardware, okay. 
such as the keyboard, okay, the mouse, okay, the motherboard, and so on. Okay, then we have the software. It's basically in simple terms, something that you cannot touch, but you are able to see. Okay, and then we have data. So data in, again in a layman's it's raw facts. Okay, something at a particular time that does not make sense. You can't make any conclusive uh, judgment from it. Okay, you can't draw any conclusion from it. Okay, any meaningful con uh, conclusion rather. Okay, not until we undergo some processing and be able to produce what is known as information. Okay, so on the other hand, uh, information is processed data. Okay, that has an additional meaning to it. Okay, and is of significance. Okay, and then uh, we have the users. Okay, so users uh, play um, a cardinal role here. Without users, they can't be computers in the first place. Okay, so users could be you and I. Okay, the front end users. You could also have back end users. So those are the people that write programs for these computers. Okay, so back end users and front end users. So front end users are you and I that interact with the computers daily. Okay, without having to bother about what is happening in the background. Okay. Yeah, so I have uh, I have already explained uh, hardware, okay, then software, or in a more professional uh, way, we are saying it's a set of instructions that tells the computer about the tasks to be performed. Okay, what tasks should be performed, and how these how these tasks are to be performed. Okay. So, and then also have a program, which is a set of instructions written in a language understood by the computer to perform a specific task, okay? And then a set of programs and documents are collectively called a software, okay? So you understand this further in the coming lectures. Okay, so data, like I said earlier, it's just real facts, which by themselves have no much significance, okay? And then the users are people who write computer programs or interact with the computer. Again, I already explained on these uh, two aspects. Okay, and then um, of particular importance again, since we know what a computer is, we know what a computer is composed of, we also need to appreciate how the interaction happens. Okay, what goes on in the interaction with, uh, with the computer. So we have the input, process output concept, okay, which is basically a concept of generating output information from input data. Okay, so the input process output concept is a concept of generating output information from the input data. Okay, so once the input, okay, the computer accepts input data from the user via an input device like a keyboard. Okay, and then once that is done, okay, that data that has been captured is actually processed. Okay, so the processing aspect comes in. So the computer processes the input data. Okay, and then afterwards there's an output. Okay, we want to see the desired result after processing. So the output is the result generated after the processing of data. Okay, and then storage, of course, so the input data instruction and output are stored permanently in the secondary storage devices okay so we'll look at um, the storage devices when we come to memory okay so like these so tips so the stored uh, data can be retrieved later whenever needed but then of course during the processing stage there's also some kind of storage that happens okay and then data during the intermediate process uh, stages of processing it's actually stored in what we call the registers okay so that's a temporal forms of storage okay that's uh, available and then there are different types of registers depending on a particular uh, uh, task at hand okay so again we appreciate registers when we come to um, our lecture two as we move on to the hardware component okay so this is the input process output storage. So again, this is basically what happens. 
whenever you get a computer, and this is what happens, is there's an input aspect from you, the user. Then there's a processing aspect by the computer, and then it gives us an output depending on the results that have actually been processed. And then there's some storage. You could actually store what has been put for us permanently for later use and so on. Okay. And then, of course, lastly, we need to appreciate the fact that these computers are used everywhere. In fact, okay, today, today's generation, everything is revolving around technology. In fact, everything is technology. The future is technology. Okay, so we are currently in the COVID era. Our lives are being made uh, or rather they are being enhanced further because of technology, okay? Right now I'm doing this video because of technology, okay? Because of the barrier of uh, COVID-19, this invention is there to make life easy. I don't have to be in class physically to teach you, no, but I can actually do remote teaching. I could use uh, Zoom and other applications, okay? Or I could record a video and send it to you, okay? So all that is made possible because of uh, the computers. So education, this video is being done for educational purposes and it's actually being done using a computer, okay? So we could cite many and many examples. Entertainment, okay, good radio station, good DJs. They use computers to achieve their daily tasks. We've got sports. Okay, we see fixtures in DSTV. Okay, we see so many leagues out there showing the league ladders and so on. Okay, so all that is made possible because of computers, advertising. Today's world has, has been made easy in terms of uh, marketing and advertising because of computers. We have social media, people go on Facebook, use WhatsApp and many other platforms, but behind that, utilize computers okay we have medicine there's so much research going on we keep on talking about covid because that is what is trending okay of course there are many other diseases but then we're referring to covid because that is what is trending research that is going on is happening on computers science and engineering okay engineering drawings are done using computers government we have e-governance today. Government workers can use their computers to access internet facilities and many other facilities within the institution or with the help of computers. Home. We have children using computers, adults, and so on. We're able to communicate with our loved ones. We're able to communicate with our loved ones from far places in the United States and so on that has been made possible because of the computers okay and many other technologies within that okay so computers should be appreciated and then also we are looking at the fact that you know there has been so much invention okay because of um, the fact that we appreciate how they work okay there has been a lot of development going on to further improve on user experience Okay, so 10 years from now, we are going to be talking about relatively small, 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 small gadgets that are going to be even more portable and more powerful. Okay, all because our lives today are actually revolving around technology. So this has been lecture one, and I hope to see you in uh, lecture two as we look at uh, computer hardware and the like. So this has been Mrs. Danda. And uh, in case of any questions, you could actually jot them down, take note of them. Then uh, if we have an opportunity of meeting in class physically, you could bring them down or I'll be able to communicate with your class rep and um, be able to see which uh, platform you could use in order to accommodate the questions that need uh, attention. So remember to mask up and please stay safe. COVID is real.